found dead in a Range Rover are believed to be drug dealers executed by contract killers. It was revealed last night. Detectives think they were lured into an ambush and shot dead as they sat in the vehicle in an Essex country lane. They suspect the killings were the result of a dispute among drug dealers. All three men are believed to be Essex criminals and the county's coast is among the favoured routes for drug smuggling. The trio were found slumped in their seats shortly before 8am yesterday in the village of Rettenden near Chelmsford by two men who were going to feed pheasants. All three victims, aged between 20 and 40, had been blasted at point-blank range in the back of the head with a shotgun. Detective Superintendent Ivan Dibley, who is leading the murder hunt, said they had yet to be formally identified but were thought to be known criminals. He said, quote, this is not an ordinary murder by anyone's standards. It looks as if they have been enticed down there, or maybe an arrangement has been made for them to be there. He said he was unsure whether more than one person was responsible. One window on the metallic blue F-registered Range Rover had been smashed, and police believe the men were shot where they sat, two in the front seats and one in the back. Forensic experts searched for clues and a weapon under a fresh fall of snow in the undergrowth surrounding the lane, which leads off the A130 Chelmsford to South End Road. Bricklayer Kenneth Jiggins and his friend farmer Peter Theobald stumbled on the scene as they went to feed Mr Theobald's pheasants. Mr Jiggins, 47, from South Woodham Ferrers, said, quote, I got out of our car to tap on the Range Rover to ask them to move it. There was no response. I called back to Peter and said, there's two men here, they've been shot, it looks like they're dead. There was blood on their faces and chests. Mr Theobald, 44, who owns nearby White House Farm, noticed a third man in the back seat. He said, quote, It was fairly obvious what had happened. It was pretty shocking. For all the world, it looked as if they were just asleep in the car. It wasn't until you looked closer that you could see that they'd been shot. The Range Rover with the body still inside was transported by truck from the scene to Broomfield Hospital Mortuary in Chelmsford. Last night, the bodies were still in the car. They were being examined by Home Office pathologist Dr Paula Lanas. Three men found dead in a Range Rover in a gangland-style murder were today revealed to be ecstasy barons suspected of providing the drug to tragic Leah Betts. Patrick Tate, Craig Rolfe and Anthony Tucker were shot in the head at point-blank range after apparently being lured to a remote farm track near the village of Rettenden, Essex, possibly to discuss a drug deal. Their bodies were found in a blood-splattered seven-year-old metallic blue Range Rover early yesterday on a snowy track four miles from Leah's home in Latchingdon outside Chelmsford. Murder Squad detectives said all were well-known criminals and police sources today confirmed they had been involved in ecstasy dealing in local nightclubs like Raquel's in Basildon, where Leah bought a fateful ecstasy tablet on her 18th birthday last month. Tate, 37, from Basildon, was known as a hardened criminal who punched his way out of court seven years ago as he was due to stand trial on robbery and drug possession charges. 
The bodies were discovered at 8am yesterday by farmer Peter Theobald and his friend Ken Jiggins on their way to feed pheasants on the remote snowy tree-lined track running across bleak open farmland. Shotgun cartridges were found scattered in the snow. Detective Chief Superintendent Ivan Dibley said he believed the men were shot in the car and that the killer would have escaped in a vehicle of his own. He said, quote, I don't know if we're looking for one perpetrator or two. Whoever killed these three people is clearly a very dangerous man. To that extent, until such time as we catch him, I am concerned that he is still at large. Extra police officers were today drafted in as the hunt was stepped up. Mr Jiggins, a 44-year-old bricklayer, told how he stumbled across the car on a lonely track known locally as Workhouse Lane. It is a known favourite rendezvous point for criminals and in summer, for courting couples. Three men were executed in a gangland ambush yesterday, just two miles from a huge drugs drop. Each had been blasted in the head with a shotgun as they sat in their metallic blue Range Rover. One of the victims was former bodyguard of boxer Nigel Benn called Tony Tucker, we can exclusively reveal. Hardman Tucker was gunned down with two associates after being lured to what detectives believe was a drugs deal down a lonely farm track used by courting couples. Known cocaine dealer Patrick Tate, 38, who also had form for robbery, was another found dead in the blood-splattered Range Rover with third man Craig Rolfe. Powerfully built Tate from Essex once staged a daring Great Escape-style motorbike getaway from a court after appearing in the dock on drugs charges. The trio, unable to turn around in a narrow lane, were trapped like rats when the killers opened fire through the windows of the vehicle. As police searched for clues, footprints and tyre marks in the thawing snow, they were looking at links with a £1 million cannabis haul in and around a nearby pond seven weeks ago. Detectives believe the drugs could have been part of a big shipment lost as it was dropped from a low-flying plane. The track where the blood-soaked Range Rover was discovered in Essex early yesterday led to an isolated fishing lake owned by farmer Peter Theobald of White House Farm. It was discovered by Mr Theobald and farmhand Ken Jiggins. The cannabis was found scattered at nearby Tanfield Tye in West Hanningfield. Farmer Jan Halstrup, who found it, said he believed the drugs were linked to the killings. Dutch-born Mr Halstrup said, quote, First of all, we found a little parcel of drugs when we were doing some hedges. I put it on the fire. Then we found another piece the size of a video cassette in my pond. Police later recovered a staggering 53 packets of cannabis wrapped in black plastic, weighing 336 pounds. Divers found a further 19 packets. One cop said, quote, I've never seen anything like this before. It's remarkable. Police are trying to discover if the killings were connected with a shooting some days ago near a little chef calf when three men were seen running away. The bodies in the Range Rover were found just 300 yards from the busy A130 Chelmsford to South End Road at Rettenden, Essex. The near side rear window had been shot out. Two bodies were in the front of the vehicle and one was in the back. Detective Superintendent Ivan Dibley said there were no signs of a struggle, suggesting they were surprised by the cold-blooded killers. He added, quote, It looks as if they've been enticed down there, or they may have had arrangements to be down there. The three men are known to us as criminals. The wounds are consistent with wounds from a shotgun. He added, There is quite a lot of blood contained in the vehicle. Mr Dibley said that at least one shotgun was used and the majority of its force was contained inside the vehicle. The condition of the body suggested they had been killed on Wednesday night or early yesterday. All three had been shot through the head. He added, quote, Whoever killed three people are clearly very dangerous, and to that extent I am concerned that they are still at large. Police who sealed off the area after the bodies were found were carrying out a careful search of the area looking for clues. Post-mortem examinations are due to be carried out today. One woman who lives near the lane, Mrs Margaret Lane, said, it's scary, we are very isolated here, and I should be very careful of people coming to the door now. Ron Foe of Rettenden Hall, a £500,000 mansion which looks down on the lane, said it would not at all be unusual to hear guns at night. People round here go out lamping for rabbits and foxes. Farmers Peter Theobald and Ken Jiggins were on their way to feed pheasants when they found a Range Rover parked by a locked gate to a lake at 8am. They had last used the lane the day before at 4pm. Ken, 47, said, 
I got out and tapped on the window to ask them to move as it was blocking the track. There was no response. I looked in and called to Peter and there were two people who had been shot. I phoned the police on my mobile. Peter came up and looked in the back and said, there's a third body here. We were in shock. It's not something you expect to find on the way to work. One man had blood coming from his nose and mouth and there was blood on the other man's chest. They looked so peaceful we thought they were asleep, but they were dead. Neither saw any footprints in the snow. Peter added, quote, We looked in for about 20 seconds and didn't see any blood on the windscreen and windows. He said criminals had often used the isolated lake over the years. Six years ago, two men hijacked a cigarette lorry and took it down the lane to tie up the driver. Stolen safes and cars have also been dumped there. The killers chose the perfect spot. Viewed from the air yesterday, it became clear that the murder scene was carefully picked out. The Range Rover used in executions was parked at the only place shrouded by trees on a remote farm track. After the shooting, the killers simply had to walk 200 yards back down the lane to jump into a getaway car waiting on the busy A130. Yesterday, forensic experts were conducting an inch-by-inch search of the track looking for the killer's footprints frozen in the ice. Whoever shot the men probably walked past White House Farm, which borders the track and the A130. The farm is now the centre of police activity. Eight squad cars and a white painted police instant caravan were parked in the yard. A team of six police officers could be seen carrying out the gruesome task of examining the area immediately around the Range Rover, which was left near a gate which blocks the track. Officers were picking through six inches of snow and mud looking for cartridges from the shotgun. Fragments of glass from a window shattered by the gun blast were also being recovered in the hope they may hold some clue to the identity of the gunman. Police believe they may have been injured by flying glass and could have left traces of blood. The lover of one of three men shot dead in their Range Rover wept yesterday as police warned of a power struggle among drug barons. Donna Jaggers, 26, said, I would just like anyone who was with them on Wednesday afternoon or who knows anything about what happened or has seen anything to just come forward. We need all the help we can get. Donna lived with Craig Rolf, 26, owner of the Range Rover, for seven years. They have one child, aged seven. Rolf should have been taking Donna to dinner the night he was killed. He was seen at 6pm on Wednesday and had arranged to meet her at a restaurant at 8pm. Police now believe the three friends, all with underworld drugs links, died between 6pm and 9pm rather than later that night. Rolf was found in the driving seat of the f Ridge vehicle in Rettenden, Essex. Bodyguard Tony Tucker, 38, was in the front passenger seat and Patrick Tate, 37, was slumped in the back. Detective Superintendent Ivan Dibley, who is leading the hunt, said all three had been shot in the head twice at point-blank range. Tate had been shot a third time in the body. The weapon, which has not been found, is thought to be a 12-bore shotgun. The men had criminal records, including armed robbery, drugs offences and car theft, but were not convicted drug dealers. Our intelligence is that they were moving into the drugs field, and that's the line of inquiry we're trying to develop, said Mr Dibley. They were higher in the scale than street dealers. It may be that this has occurred over higher drugs dealers trying to find a greater position of power. Perhaps there's been a falling out in that connection. My view is that there could be a power struggle going on. There could have been a double cross and someone has sought retribution, or it might be that somebody is owed money and they did not pay their bill. I think these are valid theories. Because drugs offer quick money and easy money, there is this power struggle amongst the larger dealers. Inevitably, there are going to be incidences such as this occurring. I don't think Essex is anywhere worse than anywhere else. However, I anticipate that someone will try to fill the void that these deaths have created and that there could be more violence. Mr Dibley added, There has been a lot of speculation overnight that this killing was connected with the tragedy of Leah Betts. I must say that this is pure speculation by the media. There is nothing factual to link these men with the tragedy of Leah Betts. I'm afraid that if this is allowed to continue, it may well divert attention from my inquiry on this murder and will take me away from the real investigation. I would appreciate if the connection between Leah Betts and this triple murder is dropped. At this moment in time, there is nothing to suggest that they distributed drugs to Leah Betts or any of her associates. Drugs gang execution victim Pat Tate was exactly what he looked. A ruthless gun-toting underworld enforcer. An armed robber and drug dealer. 
Burley Tate was built like a heavyweight boxer, as shown by our exclusive pictures of him in a prison cell. His life revolved around the three Bs, bodybuilding, blonde lover and blaggings. But his imposing physical appearance and fearless reputation were not enough to save him and two other members of his drugs gang. Craig Rolf and Tony Tucker, a former bodyguard to boxer Nigel Benn, were shot dead with him in a Range Rover on a farm track near Rettendon, Essex. Police believe their execution is part of a drugs war. The three dead men are thought to have crossed gangland families known as the Untouchables, who have formed a national mafia-style alliance to control Britain's £3 billion drug trade. Tattooed Tate, 37, seen in our pictures wearing his favourite bodybuilding vest and enjoying a mug of hooch with pals in Swaleside Prison on the Isle of Sheppey, Kent, made enemies behind bars for sucking up to prison officers. One ex-con pal said, quote, He just worked his ticket, never got in any trouble and was friendly with the screws. The hardcore cons hated him. But at Swaleside, Pat never really had any problems. His reputation and physique were enough to scare other prisoners away from him. Everyone knew he wasn't scared of trouble, and he knew how to use a shooter. Silent cons are often the ones with the biggest reputation outside. He would spend all day pumping iron in the gym. It was his only hobby. He was built like a brick outhouse. The only other thing he was interested in was his girlfriend. She was an absolutely gorgeous blonde from Essex. Another lag said, quote, Tate and Tony Tucker had fearsome reputations. They were not to be messed with. Whoever took them out must have had a lot of bottle or been a very powerful underworld figure. Before being sent down, Tate had staged a Great Escape-style motorbike getaway after knocking out his escort in court at Billericay, Essex. Helped by friends who blocked his pursuers, Tate ran from the court and jumped on a high-powered 1000cc Honda motorbike outside. The 140 mile per hour machine roared off through the crowded high street. The dead men are thought to have taken on the 12 key families behind the drugs trade and lost. The family's empire stretches from the Channel Ports to Glasgow and dwarfs the operations of the Cray and Richardson gangs of the 1960s. In London, Liverpool, Newcastle and Glasgow, factions have bought up hotels, pubs and clubs to act as outlets for their drugs, and they have secured control over the supply in a string of smaller cities. Interpol in London said the criminal network has set up bases overseas with properties in Spain, Holland and the Canary Islands. Rolf, Tucker and Tate met at the Orsic Cock pub near Tilbury, Essex car park hours before they were murdered. They were discussing their move into big time drug dealing. The execution had been ordered by a drugs baron who already controls the South East Essex turf. The trio may have believed they were on their way to buy part of the drugs hall which are dropped regularly by light aircraft in fields around Brentwood, Essex. A pub regular said, quote, I saw them meet up and watched them drive off shortly after 7pm on Wednesday. Whoever was waiting for them may well have had a tip off from the pub. All these drug dealers carry mobile phones to do their business. I had heard they were trying to start their own drug trade with profits made from an earlier drop. Detective Superintendent Ivan Dibley, leading the hunt for the killers, believes a drugs war has broken out. He said, quote, These men were moving into the drugs field. They were involved in all sorts of drugs. They are more than just street dealers, and it may be that other drug dealers are trying to maintain a higher power. Within days of being released from jail for armed robbery last month, 18 Stone Tate was shot at near his home in Basildon, Essex. His two pals were also thought to be living in fear for their lives. Last night, detectives were still hunting the Mr Big who ordered the shooting. Mr Dibley said he feared the gangland execution will escalate into more shooting incidents across the South East. Quote, when three people are involved in drug dealing are taken out of the scene, someone will inevitably try to fill the void that has been created, he said. Because of that, there could be more violence. Tucker lived in a £250,000 bungalow in Fobbing, Essex. The property boasts stables, a double garage, basketball court and security system. Rolf, 26, lived in a £100,000 four-bedroom detached home in Posh Chafford 100 in Greys. Neighbour Liz LePage, 22, said... I don't think Craig had a job. I never saw him go to work. I always wondered what he did for a living. I'm not surprised at what's happened. The police were always calling around here. Tate lived in a £90,000 three-bed semi in nearby Basildon. Tears for victim Donna Jaggers, the mother of Craig Rolfe's six-year-old daughter, broke down yesterday at a press conference organised by police. The drug dealer's 26-year-old common-law wife sobbed, quote, I just want anyone who knows anything to come forward. We need all the help we can get. 
Detective Chief Superintendent Ivan Dibley dismissed reports that the gangland execution had been sparked by a feud over who supplied drugs to Essex ecstasy victim Leah Betts. Detectives hunting the gangland killer who fired seven shots into three drug barons from Point Blank Range have yet to make any dramatic breakthrough. Inquiries are continuing and officers are following up leads from the public following massive publicity surrounding the triple murder last week. The family and friends of the three drug dealers, Patrick Tate, 37, of Gordon Road, Basildon, Anthony Tucker, 38, of High Road, Fobbing, and Craig Rolfe, 26, of Calshot Avenue, Chafford 100, were laying low again yesterday. The shooting of Tate at his home in November last year while he was out of prison on weekend release is being connected to his murder 13 months later. On that occasion, his injuries were not life-threatening and he was taken to Basildon Hospital. Murder Squad detectives are also considering the possibility of a link between the Rettendon murders and October's shooting of a patient at St Andrew's Hospital Billericay by a man dressed as a clown. Detective Superintendent Ivan Dibley and his team of 30 officers are no nearer to finding a clear motive for the killings, though they are sure the deaths are connected to some form of gangland warfare. A total of seven shots were fired through a side window of the metallic blue Range Rover at Workhouse Lane, Rettendon, with a pump-action shotgun. Police believed the three men, who had previous convictions for drug offences and armed robbery, would each have been killed by the first shot to the head. Murder Squad detectives say the response to pleas for information is disappointing. They are seeking details about the Range Rover the men were executed in on a farm track at Rettendon near Wickford. The vehicle registration is f 424 NPE. The police would also like to interview anyone who had sightings of people acting suspiciously near the scene between late evening last Wednesday and 8am the following morning. Police armed with machine guns surrounded Chelmsford Magistrates Court as two men from Essex and Suffolk were charged with the killing of three known drug dealers. Patrick Tate, Craig Rolfe and Tony Tucker were found shot dead in a Range Rover parked in the Lover's Lane in Rettendon near Chelmsford last December. Michael John Steele, 53 of St Mary's Road, Great Bentley, and Jack Arthur Wombs, 35 of Main Road, Brockford near Stowmarket, had been charged with the murders of the three men. Tight security involving armed police and dog handlers surrounded the town centre court throughout the day. The road in front was closed to traffic as Steele and Wombs, their heads shrouded with blankets, were taken to and from the building. Steele was remanded in custody to appear before South End Magistrates Court on June the 14th, while Wombs was remanded until May the 24th when he will appear at South End Magistrates Court. In addition to three murder charges, both men are accused of further, mainly drugs-related offences. Steele is charged with possessing a pump-action shotgun between January the 1st and May the 13th this year. Both men are charged with conspiring with others to import cannabis between April the 18th and May the 14th this year at Clacton. They are also accused of conspiring with others to import cannabis at Felixstowe between November the 1st and 21st last year and conspiring with others to import cannabis at Chelmsford between March the 25th and April the 16th this year. Darren Nichols, 31, of Bailey Bridge Road, Braintree, also appeared before the court, charged with conspiring with Steel, Wombs and others to import cannabis between March the 25th and April the 16th. He is also accused of conspiring with Steel and Wombs and others between April the 18th and May the 14th to import cannabis. He was remanded in custody until June the 14th, when he will appear before Southend Magistrates Court. A chance meeting in a Suffolk jail was to lead to the deaths of three drug barons who were found shot dead inside a Range Rover, a court heard. An Old Bailey jury was told Michael Steele, 54, one of the men accused of the killings, was serving time inside Hollersley Bay Prison back in 1993. It was there he bumped into his old friend Pat Tate, who was found shot dead on December 7th, 1995, along with Tony Tucker, 38, of High Road Fobbing, and Craig Rolfe, 26, of Calshot Avenue, Chafford 100. Darren Nichols, the alleged getaway driver for the killings, also shared a wing with the two men and got to know them both. He told the triple murder trial, Tate and Steele were in each other's company most of the time. When he heard Tate was coming to see Steele, he was definitely pleased. Nichols made the claims during his first day giving evidence. 
He is expected to be in the dock for nearly two weeks. Nichols claims that Steel of St Mary's Road, Great Bentley, and Wombs 36 of Main Road, Brockford, Suffolk, killed Mr Tate, Mr Tucker, and Mr Rolf after a cannabis deal went wrong. He said they lured the friends to remote workhouse lane in Rettenden with the promise of a lucrative cocaine deal, then shot them at point-blank range. The two men deny three charges of murder. Nichols told the court about four trips he made to Amsterdam to buy cannabis, including an occasion when the drugs proved to be dud. He said that was the deal that Tate and Steele fell out over, as Tate, 37 of Gordon Road, Basildon, had invested £70,000. He said it was also the deal that led to Tate's death. A supergrass at the centre of a triple murder trial has sensationally admitted illicit deals with a corrupt Essex police officer. Darren Nichols, who claims he drove the getaway car after the killings, also told the court he would have done anything to see the two men he is accused of the executions arrested. They are Jack Wombs, 36, of Main Road, Brockford, Suffolk, and Michael Steele, 54, of St Mary's Road, Great Bentley, Essex. Both have denied gunning down Pat Tate, 37, of Gordon Road, Basildon, Tony Tucker, 38, of High Road, Fobbing, and Craig Rolf, 26, of Calshot Avenue, Chafford, 100, in a Range Rover at Rettenden on December 6th, 1995. Nichols was clearly uncomfortable and often angry as he was cross-examined in the Old Bailey dock. He admitted being an informer for the corrupt officer who has been referred to as Detective Constable A in court. But Steele's defence, Graham Parkins QC, told him, quote, You were involved in illegal activities with him, and you profited from what that officer did and what he allowed you to do. Nichols got to know the policeman only weeks after the shootings, and Mr Parkins claimed that they plotted to board a North Sea ferry, steal £150,000 being taken abroad to buy drugs, planned to make amphetamine and use it to set up two men who had displeased Nichols, stole drugs and then dished them out like sweets, arranged for Nichols to sell drugs to customers, then pass on their names to Officer A so he could arrest them and win promotion told senior police officers about 60 kilos of dud cannabis, which Nichols had dumped in a gravel pit, then blamed two innocent men for putting it there. Let Nichols receive a £400 reward for his public spiritedness and bought drinks together to celebrate. Nichols claimed he only became involved with the officer in a bid to get back at the two men he claims killed Tate, Tucker and Rolf after they fell out over a cannabis deal. Quote, There was no limit to what I would do to try and get him to arrest Wombs and Steele, he admitted. But Mr Parkins rejected his claim, quote, Despite what you and Detective Constable A were up to, you never once told him, even when he raised the question of Rettenden, that you claimed to know who had committed these murders. Nichols admitted he hadn't. When questioned about Officer A by other police, Nichols claimed he was just an informer. But when those officers told him they had recordings of his telephone conversations, he said, quote, Oh dear, and laughed. Nichols told the court, quote, I laughed because the tape didn't matter to me. Compared to the trouble I was in, it was nothing. Mr Parkins pointed at Steele and Wombs, quote, Yes, by then you had made allegations in another direction. But Mr Nichols, how does one know when you are lying and when you are not? The gangland slaying of three drug dealers in Rettenden was always going to be a tremendous task for Essex detectives. But with two men starting life sentences for the murders, it was clearly not impossible. The execution-style killing of Pat Tate, Tony Tucker and Craig Rolfe by Michael Steele and Jack Wombs revolved around an international drugs deal which turned sour. It plunged former superintendent Ivan Dibley into the biggest investigation of his career, just four months before he was due to retire. And the detective who took over the inquiry, Detective Superintendent Brian Storey, said this week he was both satisfied and delighted by the verdict. More importantly, it has sent a message to all criminals that even those seen as big league are not immune from justice. The verdict comes after an investigation and trial revealing some breathtaking statistics. During the two-year investigation, a team of about 25 detectives took over 1,000 statements and completed 5,000 actions. During the 21-week Old Bailey trial, the Metropolitan Police supplied daily 72 officers to provide round-the-clock personal protection for each and every jury member. 
The main prosecution witness was in the box almost continuously for an amazing 25 days. The judge took seven and a half days to sum up and the jury took less than five to convict, delivering a unanimous verdict. It was suddenly worth the wait and waiting was something the inquiry team were used to. Superintendent Story explained, quote, We had an idea very early on who was responsible for the murders and an early arrest may have provided additional forensic evidence. But there were other risks to consider. The nature of the people involved meant an early arrest could frighten off vital witnesses and also meant the murderers might restrict their criminal activities. Essex police chose to sit tight and it paid off. Quote, We took a calculated risk, but we wanted to ensure that we were in the best possible position evidentially before we made a move, said Mr Storey. The villains were active and dangerous criminals who were aware of how to cover their tracks and conceal forensic evidence, even down to knowing what clothes to wear. Steele also admitted in court that he believed he was under constant surveillance by both police and customs. Ironically, it was the use of their mobile phones and careful analysis which helped secure their convictions. Mr Storey said, quote, Steele's downfall was partly due to the fact that he thought he was untouchable and thought he would never get caught. By biding our time, we proved him wrong. How long the message will last, I don't know. But the message is that no matter how professional you are or think you are, and no matter how well you have planned your crime or think you have, you are not immune. A meticulous investigation and, of course, a few lucky breaks can make even these crimes solvable. Labelled a one-witness trial, Mr Story admits that the key prosecution was of vital importance to the investigation. He said, quote, I always thought we would have enough to make an arrest, but not necessarily enough to convict. We had a lot of information from the public, but very little cooperation from those close to the victims because of the nature of the crime. The key was getting someone who knew what went on that night to talk. The investigation relied heavily on us using a full range of policing skills. The only way to combat these professional criminals was to use every aspect of policing available and the outcome is a tribute to all of those involved, not only within Essex Police but within the other agencies who assisted us such as HM Customs and Cirques and we thank everyone involved no matter how small their role. Superintendent Ivan Dibley was enjoying breakfast at his Chelmsford home when his telephone rang that snowy morning. He was being offered the chance to take over what would be his last and possibly most complex case, the triple gangland killing of Tate, Tucker and Rolf. But December the 7th 1995 was Mr Dibley's day off and he had promised his daughter he would sort out an electrical problem. He had headed more than 25 murder cases in the previous five years and was due to retire following 32 years in the force. Only two remained unsolved. But 1995 had proved to be a good year, and he had cleared up 10 murders in as many months. Relaxing on a leather sofa at his home just weeks ago, Mr Dibley explained, quote, I knew those bodies weren't going anywhere. No murder scene is a pretty sight. During my years in the force, I have dealt with kiddies burnt in fires and elderly women with their heads bashed in. But considering these men had been shot at close range of a shotgun, it could have been far, far worse. It didn't take long to identify the bodies. The Range Rover was registered to Rolf and detectives had in fact questioned him the day before. Steele was in the frame from day one. A friend of Rolf's revealed the dead men had met him that evening. But police could not prove his finger was on the trigger. With virtually no forensic evidence, the team had to find some other way to catch him. Detective Inspector Ivan Dibley said... There wasn't even much on house-to-house -house inquiries. They took less than a day. As he wondered where to turn next, Dibley developed a theory about the murders. Quote, I suspected that Tate was the catalyst and I proved to be nearly 100% right. I think after being incarcerated for quite a long time, he suddenly came out into the big wide world. Tucker took him under his wing and he was soon dealing with large amounts of money. I think it began to go wrong because not only was Tate by nature a violent man, but towards the time of his death he was becoming increasingly unstable due to drugs. But there was still a long way to go before Steele and Wombs would be arrested, and by then another officer, Superintendent Brian Storey, would have taken over the case. Dibley said, quote, Although we had an indicator who it was, 
you can't put all your eggs in one basket. Some policemen may think they are God, but I don't. I knew the people who were close to these characters would have a good idea of what was going on, but no one talked, and that's why a strategy had to be adopted. The strategy included a sting operation using two officers posing as IRA members Billy and John. The pair made a series of phone calls to Steele and Tate's ex-girlfriend Sarah Saunders, claiming they had lent Tate money for a drug deal with Steele and now they wanted it back. They also threatened Steele, perhaps hoping to goad him into admitting the murders. A terrified Sarah Saunders went to Basildon Police Station who played along with the sting and said the calls had been made from a well-known Republican bar in Belfast. They said detectives were monitoring the men responsible but had lost track of them when the gang travelled to the mainland. The idea appears to have been that Sarah, frightened for her life and her young son's safety, would spill the beans on Tate, Tucker and Rolf. Dibley, justifying the undercover operation, said, We wanted to flush Steele out. We also wanted to provide evidence which we could put before the court. Dibley admitted Billy and John were an unusual tactic. Quote, There was a risk we wouldn't be able to use them in court, but when you have no evidence, you have no choice. The team also checked mobile phone records and discovered Wombs made a call from Rettenden on the night of the killings. The case was three quarters complete when Dibley retired, only two weeks before Steele, Wombs, Nichols and others were arrested on May 13th, 1996. Detective Inspector Ivan Dibley added, I knew they had done the murders, I knew they were involved in drugs and I knew we hadn't enough evidence to convict them. All we needed was a bit of luck. Everything had been put into place and given a fair wind it would have the result it deserved. But he admitted, quote, it was quite galling having to leave before the investigation was finished. However, it doesn't matter when you retire from the police, it's never convenient. It was Dibley's groundwork that led to the successful conclusion of the case. During his research, Dibley had discovered Nichols was an associate of the killers. Quote, it was my view that the peripheral people involved would not want to dirty their hands with a triple murder. They were the weak link and it was Nichols who eventually provided the vital evidence to nail Steele and Wombs. Standing beside his car, the small, stockily built man exuded confidence, despite the fact he'd been stopped by police and was carrying drugs with a street value of £250,000. Even when officers opened the boot to reveal 10 kilos of cannabis, Darren Nichols barely turned a hair. It's chocolate bars, isn't it? He joked. Nichols' bravado was based on his position as a police informer. For almost a year, he'd been passing on information about fellow drug dealers and he had developed a close relationship with his two police handlers. Unfortunately, shortly after his arrest on May 13th, 1996, Nichols received very bad news. Both of his police contacts were themselves under arrest and facing charges. Worse quickly followed. In addition to the drugs offences, he was told he was being charged with the murders of Pat Tate, Tony Tucker and Craig Rolfe, three brutal gangsters blasted to death in a Range Rover at Rettendon, Essex, six months earlier, in what was to become one of the most notorious killings of the decade. Mobile phone records showed Nichols had been close to the murder scene on the night in question. He was a known drug dealer and former associate of victim Pat Tate. Darren Nichols knew he was in serious trouble and made a decision. On May 15th, 1996, Nichols started to talk, making the first of more than 20 statements. He named his friends Jack Wombs and Michael Steele as the murderers and claimed he had been duped into driving the getaway car. He stuck to his story in court and, in the face of glaring inconsistencies, a jury believed him. Wombs and Steele were each given triple life sentences, but now new evidence has cast growing doubt on the safety of their convictions. A miscarriage of justice in such a case would have implications as serious as those raised by the release of the Birmingham Six and Guildford Four. The reputation of our police and legal system rests on the word of Darren Nichols, a counterfeiter, drug dealer and self-confessed liar. It is not a comforting thought. Nichols had met Steel and Wombs in Hollersley Bay Open Prison. He was finishing a sentence for counterfeiting, having been caught with £130,000 in forged £10 notes. Michael Steele was at the end of a nine-year sentence for cannabis importation. 
intelligent, articulate and charismatic, still was someone Nichols admired. Jack Wombs was altogether different. He had no previous criminal record, but was serving 16 months after foolishly becoming involved in a fraudulent car insurance claim. Nichols had latched onto Steele and Wombs at Hollersley Bay, and after all three had completed their sentences and had been released, he seemed determined to maintain the friendship. It meant Nichols knew all about their habits and movements. Nichols told police that on the night of December the 6th, 1995, he had travelled with Wombs and Steele to a pub in Essex, expecting to pick up a consignment of cocaine. Nichols had driven his own VW Passat accompanied by Wombs, while Steele had driven his Toyota Hilux. Nichols said they waited in the car park until a dark blue Range Rover pulled up, carrying Pat Tate, Tony Tucker and Craig Rolfe. According to Nichols, Steele joined Tate in the Range Rover and it pulled away. Sitting in the Passat, Jack Wombs told Nichols to drop him in nearby Workhouse Lane, the eventual scene of the murders. Wombs said he would phone when he needed Nichols to collect him. At 7pm, the call came. According to Nichols, it was only when a blood-splattered Wombs and Steel clambered into the Passat that he realised a murder had taken place. He was so shocked he almost collided with a white van as he drove away. Despite his revulsion and horror vividly recounted in court, for six months Nichols made no mention of these events. Nichols, an electrician, continued his work rewiring Michael Steele's new house. He told the court Wombs and Steele were planning to murder him, but thought nothing of taking his wife and young children on repeated social visits to Steele's house. If Nichols is telling the truth, his conduct is hard to explain. But Nichols has a long record of lying and fabricating evidence, as he admitted in court. During the murder trial, evidence offered by tracing mobile phone calls was crucial. Records from Nichols' orange phone and Wombs' Vodafone put both men in the Rettendon area at around 7pm on the night of the murder. Wombs' phone records showed he'd made two calls to Nichols at 6.59pm. The first lasted less than two seconds and was cut off. Wombs' second call lasted for four seconds. Nichols' story is that this was the call from Wombs, calling from the murder scene on Workhouse Lane, telling Nichols to come and get me. The police used this evidence, plus the fact that none of the three deceased used their phones after 6.44pm, to fix the time of death at just prior to 7pm. Jack Wombs told a different story. A professional mechanic, Wombs agreed he'd driven to Rettendon that night, but said he'd taken a trailer to pick up Nichols' broken-down VW Passat. The car had been left in a car park. Wombs said he loaded the car onto the trailer and phoned Nichols to tell him, but Wombs heard only static and the call was terminated. Despite Nichols' lurid description of Wombs entering the Passat dripping with blood, forensic tests failed to link the car to the murders. In court, mobile phone experts argued for several days over whether it was possible to determine Wombs' location when he called Nichols. It is generally agreed the jury were confused by technicalities. It has taken two years for the defence team to get hold of Wombs' mobile phone for tests to prove his story. Their repeated requests were greeted with obstructions. Expert David Bristow finally made his tests in January of this year. It is important to understand that in certain places a mobile phone call could connect to any one of three or four different servers. Wombs call connected to what is known as the Hockley 54.3 server. David Bristow made 20 test calls from the Wheat Sheaf car park where Wombs said he was and 40 calls from Workhouse Lane, Nickel story. Vodafone's results showed that of the 20 calls from the Wheat Sheaf, over a third were picked up by the Hockley 54.3 server. Of the 40 calls from the murder scene on Workhouse Lane, not one connected with the Hockley 54.3 server. As David Bristow points out, the calls were made with Wombs' own phone at the same time of year as the murders and the same time of day. The conclusion seems inescapable. When Jack Wombs says he was in the Wheat Sheaf car park and not at the murder scene, he was telling the truth. There is, of course, a postscript to this. If Darren Nichols wasn't driving Jack Wombs in his Passat, just what was he doing that night in Rettendon? Having made his statement to police, Darren Nichols was placed on the protected witness program. All such prisoners are eventually given new identities, and in the meantime they are known as blogs. 
Nichols was Bloggs 19. While awaiting the murder trial, Darren spent time in a secure unit at Wood Hill Milton Keynes. Earlier this year, I received a surprising call from a man who had seen my previous articles on the Essex murders. Like Nichols, my caller was a Bloggs. I will refer to him as The Professor. The Professor said he met Nichols at the Wood Hill unit, a fact Nichols confirms in a recent newspaper article. The Professor remembers Nichols as a nervous wreck who drove his police handlers mad with endless demands and suicide threats. Early in 1997, the professor says Nichols asked to speak to him in private. Quote, he said the story he was supposed to tell in court was a pack of lies. Nichols asked the professor if he should go through with it. His reply was simple. If Nichols was telling lies, he'd better not get caught. Not long after this conversation, Darren Nichols was granted bail. The professor told me he assumed that Wombs and Steele were guilty and wasn't unduly bothered. Quote, I thought they were forensics, witnesses. I could ignore Darren's perjury because I thought it was the cherry on the cake. Now I realise Darren wasn't the cherry on the cake, he was the cake. After seeing the male articles, the professor understood what the trial judge pointed out. The entire case rested on Nichols' testimony. In court, Nichols claimed that Steele had decided to murder Tate Tucker and Rolf because of ill feeling about a failed cannabis deal. Nichols' earlier statements tell a very different story. But the motive he first suggested cannot possibly be true, for the simple reason that such a motive didn't exist until six weeks after the three men died. Between February the 7th and 18th, 1996, two months after the murders, Michael Steele received a number of threatening phone calls. Unfortunately, neither Nichols nor the interviewing officers realised the Irishmen were undercover police nor did they remember the Irishman had only materialised six weeks after Pat Tate's death, and so could not provide a motive for his murder. When the error was spotted, the Irishman disappeared from Nichols' statements. According to the prosecution case, Tate, Tucker and Rolf died at approximately 7pm on December 6th, 1995. However, several factors point to a later time of death. The Range Rover was untouched by snow or ice, despite standing out on a freezing night, and two local witnesses thought they heard shots between 10pm and midnight. I have discovered new evidence which seemed to support this theory of a later time of murder. On December 6th, 1995, between 8.30pm and 8.45pm, a man I shall call Ian was driving his white van towards the Rettendon roundabout. Pulling up alongside was a dark blue Range Rover carrying four men. In the back seat, Ian immediately recognised the hulking figure of Pat Tate, one of the most well-known men in that part of Essex, who according to Nichols had already been dead for over 90 minutes. Ian also saw a second passenger. The man cut a striking figure, tall and thin, wearing what looked like a black trench coat with shoulder-length blonde hair. The Range Rover accelerated up Rettendon Hill, but a moment later Ian's white van was forced to swerve violently to avoid it after the Range Rover U-turned and headed towards the murder scene. There is a secondary point of interest in Ian's story. Nichols said that as he drove Wombs and Steele away from the murder scene, his shock caused him to almost crash into a white van. In fact, it was the blue Range Rover which had the near miss, again with a white van, in the same location Nichols described. Pure coincidence? Or had Nichols witnessed the first-hand crash and used it to embroider his own story? 